We're in chapter six, part two. Then you can imagine the times that he had with his companions, ducking under the rollers or coming in on top of a comber and landing with a swash and a splutter as the big wave went whirling far up the beach or standing up on his tail and scratching his head as the old people did or playing I'm the king of the castle on slippery, weedy rocks that just stuck out of the wash. Now and then he would see a thin fin, like a big shark's fin, drifting along close to shore. And he knew that that was the killer whale, the Grampus, who eats young seals when he can get them. And Kodik, Kodik would head for the beach like an arrow, and the fin would jig off slowly as if it were looking for nothing at all. Late in October, the seals began to leave St. Paul's for the deep sea by families and tribes, and there was no more fighting over the nurseries, and the Hollis Chicky played anywhere they liked. Next year, said Matka to, to Kodik, you will be a Hollis chicky, but this year you must learn how to catch fish. They set out together across the Pacific, and Matka showed Kodik how to sleep on his back with his flippers tucked down by his side and his little nose just out of the water. No cradle is as comfortable as the long rocking swell of the Pacific. When Kodik felt his skin tingle all over, Matka told him he was learning the feel of the water. And that tingly, prickly feelings meant bad weather coming, and he must swim hard and get away. In a little time, she said, you'll know where to swim to, but just now we'll follow Sea Pig the porpoise, for he is very wise. A school of porpoises were ducking and tearing through the water, and little Kodik followed them as fast as he could. How do you know where to go, he panted. The leader of the school rolled his white eye and ducked under. My tail tingles, youngster, he said. That means there's a gale behind me. Come along when you're south of the sticky water, he meant the equator. And your tail tingles. That means there's a gale in front of you and you must head north. Come along. The water feels bad here. This was one of very many things that Kotick learned, and he was always learning. Matka taught him to follow the cod and the halibut under the undersea banks and wrench the rockling out of his hole among the weeds how to skirt the wrecks lying a hundred fathoms below water and dart like a rifle bullet in, it, in at one porthole and out at another as the fishes ran, how to dance on top of the waves when the lightning was racing all over the sky and wave his flipper politely to the stumpy-tailed albatross and the man-of-war hawk as they went down the wind how to jump three or four feet clear of the water like a dolphin, flippers close to the side and tail curved, to leave the flying fish alone because they're all bony, to take the shoulder piece out of a cod at full speed, 10 fathoms deep, and never to stop and look at a boat or a ship, but particularly a rowboat. At the end of six months, what Kodak did not know about deep sea fishing was not worth the knowing, and all that time he never set flipper on dry land. One day, however, as he was lying half asleep in the warm water somewhere off the island of Juan Fernandez, he felt faint and lazy all over, just as human people do when the spring is in their legs. And he remembered the good firm beaches of Navastoshna, 7,000 miles away, the games his companions played, the smell of the seaweed, the seal roar, and the fighting. That very minute he turned north, swimming steadily, and as he went on, he met dozens of his mates, all bound for the same place, and they said, Greeting, Kodik, this year we are all Hollis Chicky, and we can dance the fire dance in the breakers off Lacunan, Lucanon and play on the new grass, but where did you get that coat? Kodik's fur was almost pure white now, and though he felt very proud of it, he only said, Swim quickly, my bones are aching for the land. And so they all came to the beaches where they had been born and heard the old seals, their fathers, fighting in the rolling mist. That night, Kodak danced the fire dance with the yearling seals. The sea is full of fire on summer nights, all the way down from Navastoshna to Lucanon. And each seal leaves a wake while burn like burning oil behind him and a flaming flash when he jumps and the waves break in gray phosphorescent streaks and swirls. Then they went inland to the Hollis Chicky grounds and rolled up and down in the new wild wheat and told stories of what they had done while they had been at sea. They talked about the, the Pacific as boys would talk about a wood that they had been butting heads in, and if anyone had understood them, he could have gone away and made such a chart of that ocean as never was. 
The three and four year old Hollis Chicky romped down from Hutchison's Hill crying, out of the way youngsters, the sea is deep and you don't know all that's in it yet. Wait till you've rounded the horn. Hi, you yearling. Where did you get that white coat? I didn't get it, said Kotick. It grew. And just as he was going to roll the speaker over, a couple of black-haired men with flat red faces came from behind a sand dune, and Kotick, who had never seen a man before, coughed and lowered his head. The Hollis Chicky just bundled off a few yards and sat staring. The men were no less than Carrick Buterin, the chief of the seal hunters on the island, and Padalaman, his son. They came from the little village, not half a mile from the sea nurseries, and they were deciding what seals they would drive up to the killing pens, for the seals were driven just like sheep, to be turned into seal skin jackets later on. Ho, said Palamon, look, there's a white seal. Carrick Buterin turned nearly white. Then he began to mutter a prayer. Don't touch him, Padalaman. There has never been a white seal since since I was born. Perhaps it is old Zaroff's ghost. He was lost last year in the big gale. I'm not going near him, said Padalaman. He's unlucky. Do you really think he is old Zaharoff come back? I owe him for some gull's eggs. Don't look at him, said Carrick. Head off that drove of four-year-olds. Four the men sought to skin 200 today, but it's the beginning of the season and they are new to the work. A hundred will do. Quick! Petalaman rattled a pair of seal's shoulder bones in front of a herd of Hollis Chicky, and they stopped dead, puffing and blowing. Then he stepped near, and the seals began to move, and Carrick headed them inland, and they never tried to get back to their companions. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of seals watched them being driven, but they went on playing just the same. Kodak was the only one who asked questions, and none of his companions could tell him anything, except that the men always drove seals in that way for six weeks or two months of every year. I'm going to follow, he said, and his eyes nearly popped out of his head as he shuffled along in the wake of the herd. The white seal is coming after us, cried Padalaman. That's the first time a seal has ever come to the killing grounds alone. Shh, don't look behind you, said Carrick. It is Zaharoff's ghost. I must speak to the priest about this. The distance to the killing grounds was only half a mile, but it took an hour to cover, because if the seals went too fast, Carrick knew they would get heated, and then their fur would come off in patches when they were skinned. So they went on very slowly, past Sea Lion's Neck, past Webster House, till they came to the Salt House, just beyond the sight of the seals on the beach. Kodak followed, panting and wondering. He thought that he was at the world's end, but the roar of the seal nurseries behind him sounded as loud as the roar of a train in a tunnel. Then Carrick sat down on the moss and pulled out a heavy pewter watch and let the herd cool off for 30 minutes, and Kodak could hear the fog dew dripping off the brim of his cap. Then 10 or 12 men, each with an iron-bound club three or four feet long, came up, and Carrick pointed out one or two of the herd that were bitten by their companions or too hot, and the men kicked those aside with their heavy boots made of the skin of a walrus's throat. And then Carrick said, let go! And then the men clubbed the seals on the head as fast as they could. 10 minutes later, little Kotick did not recognize his friends anymore, for their skins were ripped off from the nose to the hind flippers, whipped off and thrown down on the ground in a pile. That was enough for Kodak. He turned and galloped. A seal can gallop very swiftly for a short time back to the sea. His little new mustache bristling with horror. At Sea Lion's Neck, where the great sea lions sit on the edge of the surf, he flung himself flipper overhead into the cool water and rocked there, gasping miserably. What's here? said a sea lion gruffly, for as a rule, the sea lions keep themselves to themselves. Scoochney, Oshin Scoochney. I'm lonesome, very lonesome, said Kodik. They're killing all the Hollis chicky on the beaches. The sea lion turned his head inshore. Nonsense, he said. Your friends are making as much noise as ever. You must have seen old Carrick polishing off a herd. He's done that for 30 years. It's horrible, said Kodik. Backing water, as a wave went over, went over him and steadying himself with a screw stroke of his flippers that brought him all standing within three inches of a jagged edge of rock. 
Well done for a yearling, said the seal lion, who could appreciate good swimming. I suppose it is rather awful from your way of looking at it, but if you seals will come here year after year, of course the men get to know of it, and unless you can find an island where no men ever come, you will always be driven. Isn't there any such island? began Kodik. I've followed the Poltus, the halibut, for twenty years, and I can't say I've found it yet. But look here, you seem to have a fondness for talking to your betters. Suppose you go to Walrus Islet and talk to Sevich. He may know something. Don't storm off like that. It's a six-mile swim, and if I were you, I would haul out and take a nap first, little one. Kodik thought that that was good advice, so he swam around to his own beach, hauled out, and slept for half an hour, twitching all over, as seals will. Then he headed straight for Walrus Islet, a little low sheet of rocky island almost due northeast from Navastoshna, all ledges and rock and gull's nest where the walrus herded by themselves. And we'll pick up there next time.